Namaste. So we're having a wonderful thunderstorm and monsoon rains this evening and the last few days. It's very interesting. Climate change is increasing the amount of rain we get and actually cooling the summer temperatures because the uh, equatorial rain bands circulation has been disturbed. They're coming farther north now and they're hitting Tamil Nadu, whereas they never used to. We used to have to rely on the western prevailing winds to blow the rain over from Kerala. <laughs> now we're getting our own local storms. It's very nice. You hear that? Beautiful sound. So anyway, we're looking at what is our role in the world. So yesterday we talked about who we are. Today we're going to talk about what the world is. And tomorrow we're going to discuss what is our role. So we are shamans. We are not confined by any culture or any religion or any specific methodology or vocabulary or style. We can do pretty much whatever we want as long as we remain attuned and aligned with the purpose of self-realization. Now I've often said here that self-realization is the purpose of the entire universe. So let's look at the creation. The world is divided into two parts. Creation, the natural part, nature, and human culture. That's the unnatural part. So first of all, what is the creation? The creation is a living machine that is tasked with developing novelty, change, and this change, since the beginning of the universe, as far as anybody can tell, has only increased. And not only that, especially in the last few hundred years, the rate of increase has also increased. And that's what's called a, a logarithmic curve. Uh, so, or a power curve. It starts out real low and steady, and then at some point it hits an inflection, and then shoom, it goes up through the roof. So change is going through the roof in the creation. That's what it was designed for. That's how it was made. Exponential change. You probably heard that expression. But what does it mean? Well, the creation was created <laughs> because Shiva wanted to experience all kinds of possibilities, all kinds of reflections of himself, because he can't see himself. He can only see himself as a reflection, like in a mirror. And so, all these living creatures were created to reflect Shiva as above, so below, right? The living creatures also ex experience and express similar things as Shiva does. And Shakti, his power, is the mother. She loves to bring forth fecund waves of changes. The more wild and crazy, the better. Consider biological or genetic evolution. Let's assume they're true. <laughs> There's not somebody up on a cloud 
cooking up new weird animals <laughs> and plants. It's a machine that once set in motion does that all by itself. And it does that through mutations. And mutations take a long time because the feedback loop between mutation and survival ability takes at least three, four, five generations to loop back as many as 10, 20 generations to really make a profound difference in the genetic, genetic biome of the species. Now, where does humankind come into this? Well, we've been given a special kind of intelligence, language. We can make up stuff, we can plan, we can have ideas and express them in language. And this is a very powerful tool, much more powerful than fire or agriculture or any of the previous uh, inventions. The wheel, the spear, the bow and arrow, huh? those are nothing compared with the invention of language and especially writing. Because now the knowledge that is accumulated by each generation can easily be passed on to the next. Now, along with language, however, have come some negative points. And one is that language can never exactly express what it's talking about. It's always more or less approximate. And because language relies on metaphors, some interpretation is required in order to put it into action. You know? What is it? Insert tab A into slot B, <laughs> right? Somebody's always going to get it wrong, no matter how simple the instructions are, because of this stage of interpretation. We tried to cover this in matrix learning and earlier series, but that problem is always going to remain. It's always going to require somebody to interpret the language. This is another reason why computers are so dumb. They only do exactly what they're told. The problem is our language and our ways of thinking, even when translated into computer code, are ambiguous a lot of the time. So what happens is that people get attached to old ways of doing things, and especially when it benefits them. A person who is in a position of power does not want things to change. So they come up with things like schools and universities and literature and religion and a political science, economic science. Why? To keep things the way they are, to stop change. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> Considering as the whole mechanism by which the universe approaches its destiny is radical and ever-increasing change, who do you think is going to win? So we see human history as a tragic comedy of failed states, failed economies, failed religions, failed cultures, going back, back, back into the past. And we always imagine that, oh, our culture is going to be there forever and it's always going to grow and become more and more prosperous, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to colonize planets now. <laughs> it might happen. But at some point, every culture breaks down. At what point is that? When its sclerotic, rigid structures of semantics, of knowledge, of language, cripple it to the point where it destroys itself. Now, Western culture is approaching that now. So 
the only thing that happens by suppressing change is that you store up change <laughs> until you can't stop it anymore. And then there's a really big change. And then the culture collapses, the civilization, the economy, the government, the religions, the cultures, they all just collapse. Armageddon. Apocalypse. And then there's an interval of post-apocalyptic chaos. And then some wise guy starts the whole thing all over again. <laughs> we can't be happy to live within our means. This is one of the defining characteristics of culture. It's like a projection of our individual greed and desires on a whole group of people. And leaders, rulers, government people, power possessing people are especially greedy because they're greedy for a whole group of people that are under their control. So they don't want us to learn how to change and adapt to changing circumstances. They want us to help them keep everything the same because that keeps them in power. What do you know? So we see a whole situation like a pyramid today where there's a few elites at the top and then many, many sheeple under their control working their buns off in factories and schools and offices huh? on the internet making up all these stories to convince you why things have to keep going on just the way they are. Huh? Economics is not presented as a theory. It's presented as a fact. Even though every single economic theory has failed. Every single currency has failed. Even when they're based on gold and silver. Every religion has failed. That's why it needs to be reformed every so often. And, of course, every political party has failed. Every ruler has failed. And, of course, historians will tell you there are cycles, you know, and this and that. And that's true. But it's also true that all the civilizations <laughs> they use to come up with these cycles are dead. So the death of a culture, the death of a civilization is actually impossible to avoid. As hard as they try, it always fails. And that's because the underlying structure of nature is such that change is inevitable. Change cannot be stopped. Change always increases and gets more and more wild and radical. Now, we had a moment back in the 60s, and maybe up into the 70s, where radical change, deprogramming from the past, or deconditioning from our social conditioning, became a thing. And the tools that made that possible were psychedelics and theogens, to use the polite term. And these entheogens, now that research is being allowed into psilocybin, LSD, and so on, they're seeing that what they do is they open up fixed nerve pathways in the brain to allow learning to take place. Now, as anybody who has followed our discussions on school and learning knows, the older methods of schooling, state-mandated schooling, uh, which is like a 12-year prison sentence, according to uh, expert educators, <laughs> all it does is make you so sick and tired of school that you don't ever want to learn anything more in your whole life. The elites love this. This is just what they need. Huh? Stop people from learning. 
make those neural pathways solid as a rock so that nobody wants to change. And that's actually their social program. Don't change. Keep us in power. Stay a slave. Work for us. Give us your best years of life, your best energy. And we'll simply enjoy it. When you're burned out, we throw you away and you go homeless. They're so cruel. We could do a lot better than that. And in the next episode, we're going to talk about what we could do to make a society, to make a culture that is better than that. Aung Tatsa. Aung Shakti Aung.